see all of you this evening. Thank you for your open hearts to the Lord. Um, and uh, thank you to, uh, to Superintendent Yancey. Thank you, Terry and Karen, for your hospitality. We love you guys. You're some of our best in our fellowship. I, tell you, I just I always believe great leaders like this from Jesus' hand. some bread together and have been fellowshipping. You know, once in a while when Terry and I are together at conferences, uh, we once in a while we go out running together. And he's going to run a marathon in May. You knew that, right? Yeah. He, he's just like the jock, man. He's like the stud. He's like the man. Oh. I'm sorry. I broke it. Yeah, but anyway, my running days are over, but you are carrying on. The, the, <laughs> we just appreciate you. Thank you for that kind introduction, and thank you for getting that out of the way early so we can focus on other things at this point. And uh, I deeply appreciate the opportunity to be here. And um, boy, I see the Hollises back there, and uh, there they are. Great to see them. Um, and uh, and I think I've seen the Cawthons here, and uh, saw Darren and Marlene back there. They, they were on a trip that Sandy and I led of district youth directors. It was a lot of fun through Israel. It was great. You know, when you travel for a week, a week and a half with DYDs, <laughs> it's a memorable experience. And uh, I remember about the third day, the bus started getting wild, and Sandy looked at me and she said, well, that jet lag's wearing off. <laughs> we had more fun that week, I'll tell you. That's the way to travel with Israel. And others of you are here tonight. We've been in Israel together. And uh, friends from other districts here with booths and things. And it's just great seeing you all. I've been to Wichita many, many times because uh, one of your former superintendents, my, my father-in-law, Dad Lohenberg, let me marry his only daughter and live to tell about it. I'm, I'm especially, you know, I know he was your superintendent for 16 years, but I'm especially grateful that he let me marry his only daughter. And uh, what a gift she's been. We've been married just over 30 years. We both got married in our early 30s. We were pretty zealously single. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Sandy's brother Doug had become one of my best friends and uh, never told me he had an eligible sister. I actually met Sandy's mom before I met Sandy's dad. And of course, we were both single. And I, I, you know, they say me, you know, behind every great, every good man, there's a great woman and a surprise mother-in-law. You know, but I had a really good mother-in-law, and uh, so I met her before I met Sandy's dad. And uh, and uh, from what I understand, she said one day to Sandy, "Now that's a very nice young man." Speaking of me, and uh, uh, I, I think Sandy said too short. I think she only had two words, too short. So. And she has told me she had to she had to throw out her list when she married me. But, you know, I, I've long thought that tall, dark, and handsome thing you know is like way overrated. Nothing personal to some of you, but you know, you know, short, fair, and questionable. <laughs> I'm grateful Sandy uh, settled for that. And, and then Dad Lohenberg, of course, came into my life, and uh, what an encouragement. He just became a great encourager to me. I tell you, I just uh, loved him. And he told me lots of stories of being your superintendent. See, Leon, he were back there, and great friends. You were to Dad Lohenberg, the Hollis's, many, many of you, such great friends to Dad Lohenberg, and thank you. And uh, it was one of the honors of his life to, to be a superintendent of this network back a number of years ago. Now my, my pastor right now is Jeff Peterson, and his father was the network supervisor, I think in the 1990s, right? And so Jeff was texting me on the way here while I was driving and saying, be sure to tell this family greetings from my parents. And so everybody sends their love to you. And I bring you greetings from Dr. George Wood as well, who is our general superintendent and a wonderful wonderful man of God. He, he tonight is somewhere in Alabama preaching at the uh, 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 preaching well, you, you guys are with it I'll tell you. 
So he's, uh, it's our 100th anniversary, so he's preaching at the 100th anniversary of the Alabama district. Okay. You know, I like to say about the Assemblies of God, uh, we're older than we look. <laughs> we're actually 101 years old now. But I want to tell you, 54% of our fellowship is under 35 years old. Isn't that amazing? Now they pay me in part to keep the statistics, so I know these things. And 54% of the Assembly of God is under 35. And the evangelical world is largely losing ground in America. But I do believe, um, even though we're one of the few evangelical bodies that's still growing, I do believe God's going to send one more spiritual awakening to him. Amen. I just believe it. I don't think we deserve it. I don't think we pray for enough for it. But deep in my heart, I believe this for years. I just believe God's going to send one more spiritual awakening to America. And he is giving us stewardship. You know, we all know the kingdom of God's bigger than the assemblies of God. But here, you know, he calls us all of us to some family with whom we can do more together than alone. God has given us, for some reason, an amazing generation to steward and to see raised up in the years ahead. That I believe will be part. I believe there's a generation coming that's going to accomplish what my generation has done. And um, it's awesome. So thanks for the way you care for the kids in your churches, the way you're caring for the young people, and the young adults, and the young families. And thank you for the way you're continuing to honor the seniors that have gone before us and and just blazed a trail. And, and thank God for you and, and your hearts. And God's given us, a, a, at this pivotal moment in history, an unbelievable responsibility to honor the generation that's gone before us and to invest in the generation that's following us. And that's what I want my life um, to be about as well. And I love the way I sense that in this network. And God bless you all. I'd like you to turn to 1 Samuel chapter 14. I was actually going to speak on something else a few months ago when Pastor Terry uh, talked to me about this evening, but I really, I, I really felt just recently really redirected to this particular passage of Scripture. It's actually one of my favorite stories in the Old Testament. It's a story about a prince. It's a hero story about a prince. His father was the first king of Israel, Saul, and, and his son's name is Jonathan. And I'm just going to read one verse in 1 Samuel. Did I say that, 1 Samuel? Yes. 1 Samuel chapter 14 and verse 6, just to get us going. I'd like to read this introductory verse and then ask you a question today. The verse 6 says, Jonathan, Prince Jonathan, said to his armor bearer, Come, let's go over to the outposts of those uncircumcised fellows. Perhaps. For nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. That, by the way, would be the 3,000-year-old version of you and God are a majority. Amen. Now, most of us believe that, but we don't live like it. <laughs> well, let's just take those last two sentences one more time. Perhaps the Lord will act in our behalf. For all I know is that nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. So here's the question I felt to ask you as a ministry network tonight. What is the next risk that God is speaking to you as a network about taking over the next one year? I mean, let's shorten it. Between now and the end of this year, what is the next risk that God is asking you to take for the sake of a million and a half unclaimed people in Kansas, let alone what we need in our nation? What's the next risk? Now, in the investing world, we say no risk, no reward. In the athletic world, we say no pain, no pain. And in the spiritual realm, we say no steps of faith. No breakthroughs. Wow. No steps of faith. Yeah. No breakthroughs. And that's why I'm asking you, for the sake of unplanned people and spiritual breakthrough that God wants to bring in our nation, what is the next risk that God is talking to you about? Mm. As
as a network, which will translate into the risk your church will need to take, which will translate into the risk that you personally, as a spiritual leader, what's the next risk that God is asking you to take? Now, what can I say about risk? I wish I could sanitize it, but risks are risky. I was reading about the African gazelle a while back, and they're saying it's one of the fastest land animals on the continent of Africa. It can broad jump 30 feet, and it can high jump 10 feet. But you can keep a gazelle contained in within a wall of only three or four feet high, even though it can jump higher than I can reach. And the reason is a gazelle will not jump, it will not leap, unless it can see ahead of time where its feet are going. And I read that and I thought, that sounds just like the coward I want to be most of the time. I mean, I want to hedge my bets. I'm not going to leap unless I'm pretty sure I know where I'm going to land. But I want to tell you, if you know where your feet are going to land, folks, it's not a risk and it doesn't take faith. But I'm asking, what's the risk that God is asking you to take? Where we're not sure where our feet are going to land if we try this. We're not sure how the dollar signs are going to add up if we try this. We're not sure what people are going to think about us if we try this. We're not sure if we're going to succeed or whether this dream will be a pile of ashes five years from now. We're not sure, but we're going to leap because we feel that God is asking us to take a step. Now, when it comes to risk, Jonathan's our poster boy. The story really starts in the previous chapter. and There we see that early in Chapter 13, Jonathan and Saul sort of pull off what you'd call a foreign policy blunder. And they get the bad guys, the Philistines, really upset with them. The Philistines are sort of our favorite bad guys in the Bible. And uh, they get them really upset. And so, and, and so we're not far into chapter 13, and we hear that the Philistines are on the march. They are just angry with Israel, and they're going to pounce on them. And they, they pull out. They pull out 3,000 chariots and all kinds of charioteers. And then they say, and foot soldiers as numerous as the sand on the seashore. That's a very biblical way of saying, we're in a heap of trouble right now. <laughs> on top of that, I don't know how they got their news, but, uh, but everybody went into hiding. And I don't know whether they got up the next morning, you know, turned on their iPads and saw about the war. And, and they, they immediately knew this was a hopeless war. So we're told that instead of people gathering around King Saul, by and large, they headed for the hills. They literally were hiding behind bushes, in holes in the ground, and in caves in the mountain. They just ran and tried to hide. And just to thicken the plot a little bit, we learn that during this time, this historically is what we call the early Iron Age, early Iron Age one period, um, and and uh, Sandy and I, and some of you have toured Israel with us, we've been in some of these, uh, the Philistine area, the hill, hill country where David was, and, uh, and Jonathan here, and you can still see the archaeological remains of, of, of early iron smelting industry. Well, anyway, Philistines had the monopoly on the ironworking industry. And so it just happens that as the Philistines are mustering this huge army to come against Israel, at this particular moment, Israel only had two, two swords in the entire country. King Saul had one, and his son, Prince Jonathan, had another. So let's get the picture. God's people are hopelessly outnumbered. They're pitifully under-resourced. And all the volunteers are united. I mean, this sounds exactly like church work to me. This is, I've been a pastor long enough. This is church work beginning to end. I mean, we're outnumbered, we're under resources, and where are those volunteers when you need them? I mean, this is church work to the core. So chapter 14, Jonathan says to his armor bearer, that's verse 6 where we just were. Jonathan says to his armor bearer, armor bearer, um, Somebody's got to do something. So you and me, we're going to go over to those Philistines. You and me, with our one sword. For perhaps the Lord will act on our behalf. Because all I know is that we serve a God who seemingly is unimpressed with large numbers. He doesn't need a lot of it. Us, because the pressure's on him, not us. He's able by many or by few. I once heard this story told from the perspective of the Philistine, I mean, of, 
the armor bearer, and it forever changed the way I heard this story. I read this story. Because I, I could imagine if I was armor bearer, I would have immediately gone, oh, time out, right there, Jonathan. Would you just punch the rewind button for a moment? And would you please tell me you just, you didn't just say, perhaps the Lord will work on our behalf. I mean, Jonathan, you don't have a word from God on this. We're about to leap. And, and you don't have a word from God. I mean, I mean, please tell me. I mean, you had a dream. At least tell me you've had a dream. Or, or maybe you've been to Kansas Ministry Network conference and, 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 and he had at least, you know, at least one prophetic confirmation. I mean, I'd prefer three, but at least one prophetic confirmation. I mean, please tell me you've seen an angel in the sky just kind of writing the words, do it. I mean, I need, I need you to give me something more than a perhaps here. And Jonathan said, I'm sorry. See, this is risk, right? And Jonathan said, I'm sorry, I don't have a clear word. I'm not sure what's going to happen to us. All I have is a maybe. But I love what one friend of mine likes to say. God has his way of turning our maybes into his miracles. And, and he says to Armour Bear, he said, I only know one thing for sure. I only know that God doesn't need a lot of us. That he is able by many or by few if we do this. That's all I need. I have a perhaps in terms of the outcome. But I want to tell you, for the risks that God's going to talk to you about taking, um, that's all you have, a perhaps. Who knows? Who knows where it'll all go? But you know what? I love what Jonathan does not do. He doesn't do the despair thing. He's like, well, after all, I'm only one person. I mean, I only have one sword. I mean, what difference can I make? I mean, how many people have we all heard say, oh, come on, Pastor, I'm only one person. What, what do you expect of me? He doesn't do the despair thing. And he doesn't do the insecure thing. Well, I'm not qualified to attack a whole army all by myself. Well, join the human race. Who is? And he doesn't do the victim thing. Like, you know what? I didn't get us in this trouble. I mean, my dad's the king. I mean, how come when something needs done around here, it's always me they ask. What about all these other deadbeats? Why don't they do something? How come I'm always the one who's got to do something when we're in trouble? I mean, he doesn't do the despair thing. He doesn't do the insecure thing. He doesn't do the victim thing. He just said, perhaps the Lord will do something, which means I can't stand still because he is able by many or by few. I love this about God. He sang about it being the great I am. And, and he's saying, our God has capacity. It's not like he's impressed with us. It's not like, you know, he said, boy, many of you know my backgrounds in rocket science. It's not like he's saying, you know, boy, if I could just get a rocket scientist and make him the general secretary of the Son of God, just think of what finally we could get done around here. I mean, you know what? At my best, I'm not I'm very impressive compared to the one who made it all, who is sovereign over all. I love Psalm 115, verse 3. It says, our God's in the heavens, and he does whatever he wants. I love that. I mean, he's in the heavens, so you can't contain him. And he does whatever he wants, so you can't control him. I mean, what do you do with a God who's alive and loose? I mean, what do you do? I mean, we want to tame him. We want to make him a domestic house cat. But he's the Lion of Judah. He doesn't need a lot of us. He's able by many or by few. It's not like he's waiting for some talented person to show up and do what he can't do without us. No. Thank God he's not impressed with him. Thank God I don't have to be impressed with him. He is able by many or by few. The pressure's on him. All we need is a perhaps, because here's what we know for sure. He is able by many or by few. When I'm overwhelmed, he's not. When I'm perplexed, he's not. I love this. When I'm nervous, he's not. And you know what? The things that weaken me don't weaken him. He can't be diminished. In fact, I believe it was the Apostle Paul who said, God does his best work in our weakness. He does his best work in our weakness. That's why we can be okay with the perhaps. Because we know for sure he's able by many or by few. Well, I really got a, began to get a taste of this, you know, when I was like, I was 19 years old. I transferred to the University of Minnesota in my third year of study, uh, what would be nine years of studying aerospace engineering. I transferred to the University of Minnesota, where I stayed the next seven years, and uh, as a junior. And I found a little, the Assembly of God had started a little campus ministry. And uh, I found it took me a month and a half to find it. And uh, it was
was it was really shrinking. I heard there was this great ministry. I was so looking forward to going and being a part of it. And the campus pastor was just resigning, and the student leaders were all graduating. And, and I finally found this little group of 12 students. It was depressing. Uh, we were just our first meeting. We talked not about nothing about other than all the leaders had left. I always see Bob and Paula Marks. Bob teaches uh, works on national leadership with Kyle. I love and appreciate him. Been with them in Europe as well. He's heard this story too many times. But you know, I, I was I love Jesus. I grew up in a strong Pentecostal home. My dad was just an active volunteer, was not pastor, but an active <coughs> volunteer. He was just a great guy, and I love Jesus with all my heart. But I was short, as I mentioned, I'm still short. <laughs> I was shy, I was very, very shy. And I watched Star Trek way too much. <laughs> and I'd never led a thing in my life. And um, at the end of that, year, that my junior year, by default, I became the leader of this sick Kyle of I mean, It was just sick, there was nothing good to say about it. So, and it got sicker. Over the next year, I shrank it from 12 down to three. It was the only time I was number one in the Assemblies of God in the country. I was the number one campus ministry shrinker. <laughs> and um, three, me and two other guys, and one of the other two guys, I was just before, I was just about done. I was in my last semester before I get my bachelor's degree. I decided to stay for graduate school. And um, uh, I knew I'd failed. I was sure I was supposed to be an engineer because I certainly failed at ministry and leadership. But I still love Jesus. And my friend sat in my dorm room, one of the other two guys who came to our Kyle for group, and sat in my dorm room and said, uh, you know what, maybe we should pray and fast, which is the obvious thing to say. And I don't know if he ever did much of that, to be honest, himself. But in that moment, God gripped my heart. I was a 21-year-old kid, and I became desperately hungry for God. I mean, it was so intense, I'd never experienced it in my life. I'd seen the power of God and experienced the power of God many times. But I'm sitting in Territorial Hall on the campus of the University of Minnesota. And it's not a Sunday, and it's not a service. It's just hanging out with one of my friends one day, one afternoon. And he looks at me and says, maybe we should pray and fast if God grips my heart. And begins to squeeze it and make me desperately hungry. I would, I would feel driven to pray. If I had an hour between classes in the morning, I'd feel driven to pray. I'd feel driven to pray late at night. I had a non-Christian roommate. He didn't exactly get into me lying on the floor and travailing in the spirit. But we fortunately had an old Chi Alpha office we were about to lose on the edge of campus. It had a desk and a carpet, not even a chair, not even a bookshelf, a desk and a carpet. And I would lie on that floor. It was messy. I would lie, and sometimes for two hours, all I could do was just groan. I just groaned. Oh, God. I was so hungry for him, so desperate. I was such a failure as a minister. I was so, 45,000 students on our campus, and, and, and the only Pentecostal ministry was just about extinct. And all I could do was lie in my face. I didn't even know what was going on inside of me, but I was just groaning. And, and the intensity of that, it would take my appetite away for days. I, I was, yes, eating dorm food, but in spite of that, I, I wouldn't want to even go down to meals some days. I would just, I just, and, and God just, God just worked this in me. He didn't explain himself. He didn't give me a vision. He didn't give me a master plan. He just, he just began to work a maybe into my spirit again. Until, as far as I remember getting in that very intense, was saying, God, we're the only Pentecostal ministry on this campus of 45,000 students, and there's three of us. You can do better than that. I remember actually having the boldness to pray that. And that's kind of where it ended. Lord, I just know you can do better than that. That was my version of maybe. Maybe God still wants to do something. But I didn't know how to do it. And nothing happened. As is often the case, nothing happened immediately. But a year and a half went by. I already decided I was going to graduate school there. I'm in midway through fall semester of my second year of graduate school. We'd already done our new student outreach at the beginning of that. But it failed as usual. So I was doing I was doing my graduate school thing. We were just having our, our weekly Chi Alpha meetings. And we'd grown back up to a dozen again. Mainly people who felt a burden to pray. And I'll never forget, it was late October, early November. I walked into that Chi Alpha meeting. Having thought, if 15 people ever showed up to this meeting, it would be like revival hit this campus. <laughs> You know, that night, I have no human way of explaining how or why this
this happened. And I don't know why then, but um, my life changed that night. Because I walked in a group, instead of finding 12 or even 15, there were 65 students here. They came in, in clusters of friends, not from one other ministry, just all over the place. It's like God sovereignly opened everybody's eyes to our presence that night, and the Spirit of God <coughs> fell on us. It was powerful. And they all came back the next week, started bringing their friends. I spent my last three and a half years trying to earn my PhD, figuring out how a short, shy kid who watched Star Trek too much pastors um, a, a ministry of 100 people and, you know, and figured this all out. It was the most adventurous time of my life. But I want to tell you, he's able Amen. by many or by few. He's not able in spite of us. He still needs us to take the jump to take the step of faith. But I'll tell you, all we have is a baby. I didn't have to do that for me. But he loved a lot of students far too much. And, and he just stepped in and did something that I couldn't do. Jonathan said to his armor bearer, maybe the Lord will work on our behalf. That's all we have. But it's enough because all we know is that he's able by many, her by few. I mean, it's very humbling. I, I, I think often of that thing. To think that there is something happened that I humanly have no way of explaining. And I want to tell you, unless God's doing stuff we can't account for, we're dead in the water anyway, right? Why, why walk around like we're impressed with ourselves? Come on. Unless God's doing stuff we can't account for, we're dead in the water anyway. So why not act on the perhaps? Why not leave even though we're not sure where our feet are going to land? And let's see what God might do. Yeah. Let's see what God might do. So Jonathan says to Armour Bear, i got a plan. I'm sure Armour Bear said we could use a plan right now. He said, you see those sentries up there on the hill? There was like a pass, like a valley, and on the top were Philistine sentries. He said, we're going to come out of hiding. We're going to go over there in the middle of the pass. We're going to do whatever it takes to get their attention. And then we're going to listen to what they say. You know, if you keep reading from verse 6, you'll see all this. And if they say to us, hey, stay there, we're coming down to get you, then well, armor bearers, been a nice life. Been a short one, but a nice one. <laughs> but if they say the less likely thing, if they tell us to go up and see them, then that's our sign. We attack. I'm sure armor bearers going, Go on. <laughs> and, you know, no, that's the plan, Jonathan said. Our reverend said, let me get this straight. There's, there's, there's a part A and a part B, right? Part A, they say, stay there and we're dead meat. Or part B, plan B, we get to attack that entire army all by ourselves with one sword. You say, Jonathan, if you've never been to the University of Kansas and taken Logic 101, they tell you there's always a third, create a third alternative. We could really use that right now. And Jonathan said, sorry, no, no creative third alternative. Because here's what I love about Jonathan, the risk taker. He, he knew one thing for sure, that God didn't need a lot of us. He just, even if it was only one or two, that's all he needed because the pressure's on him. And, and he's running the show. So because of that, it only left Jonathan with two options, not three, to get himself out of the first two. Just two. He was either going to win or die trying. That's it. Now I wonder whatever has happened to that spirit. Amen. We're going to win or die trying. We don't have a third creative alternative that gets us out of either one of those. We're going to win. I love the motto of the French foreign legion. If I, if I falter, push me on. If I stumble, pick me up. But if I retreat, shoot me. I love that. You know what? The older you get, the harder it is to take risks. The harder it is to step out on your baby. The harder it is to put everything on the line. Because you feel like you've got a lot to lose. But I want to tell you, if we ever lose the win or die trying spirit, uh, we're going to rock our way into spiritual mediocrity. You know what? You don't stay alive unless you keep stepping out on the maybes and you keep taking risks. It's how we stay alive. And it's how breakthroughs come that touch unclaimed people in our lives.
You know what? We get so, I, I worry we live way too safely. You know, we just fear, but what if it doesn't turn out? I mean, we sometimes fear failing so much, we don't even try in the first place. I mean, I mean, how ridiculous is that? And you know what? If you take a risk, if you obey the Spirit of God and take a risk, you're going to have people looking twice at you. And you may even get your feelings hurt. I love to tell, I love to tell church volunteers, if you haven't had, if you haven't been hurt in church, like where have you been? Uh, like you haven't lived. You know? I mean, it, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. No one's going to appreciate it as long as things are going well. And as soon as you mess up just once, everybody be in your face. But I want to tell you, God is concerned about more than protecting your feelings. He's concerned about one and a half million unclean people. You know what? He may actually let your feelings get hurt. But there's a more important thing going on. Some of us just were so afraid that so we're going we're gonna to get criticized. We're going to get our feelings hurt. And, and if we are wrong, if it doesn't work out, just think of what people will say. Well, you know what? Who cares? I picture your future like a pathway with people lining both sides of that pathway. And, and, and those are the people that you're going to influence for the rest of your life. And, and I don't remember what, just, just having this insecurity fit and saying, God, I don't know why you use me. Why do you call me? I'm short, shy. I like Star Trek. I mean, why do you call me? All this stuff. And you know what? And finally, the Lord just spoke to me and said, look, look, I love people so much that I'll even use you if I have to. It really helped me. It just reframed the whole thing. I'll even use you if you have to. You see, he's got this whole lineup of people in your future that he is destined that you touch by his grace. But if you live safely, if you're just living so self-protectively, you don't ever want to do anything, well, you might get your feelings hurt, you might get criticized, you might have to say, well, I, you know, best I knew, I thought God was asking me to do it, didn't work, you know, you know, and they're going to slam you for that. I mean, who cares? The one thing we can't afford is to let any of that stuff keep us from taking the leap. Look, we only have it, perhaps. This is a risk. This is a step of faith. But God is able by many or by few. And he's desperate to reach a world that needs him. And he'll even use us, even if our feelings do get hurt. And um, some of us just say, don't, don't, please don't talk to me about any of this stuff. I just want to be, just leave me alone. I like familiar. I like predictable. I like comfortable. You know, I love all those things myself. I'd much prefer God was just really safe, but he's not. That's right. I, I, I'd, much, I'd much rather his calling didn't have any perhapses in them. But it's full of perhapses. But he said, that's why this is faith. You just lean on me. You do what I tell you, and you make sure you're not living safely and watch what I can do. So Armour Bearer and Jonathan go out into the pass. They start jumping up and down and hooting and hollering, and sure enough, they get this Philistine's attention. You can read what happens. I imagine one Philistine said, hey, let's go down and get him. And the other Philistine probably said, you know what? They're acting so crazy down there. In fact, the scripture says that one Philistine does say to another, hey, look, those Israelites are coming out of their holes. So that was not intended to be flattering. <laughs> they look like fools. And I can just see the other Philistines saying, you know what, this is a very boring war for those guys. I bet if we asked them to come up here, they'd actually do it. He said, that's not a bad, this is a boring war. That's a pretty good idea. Let's see what happens. So they yell down there. Hey, you two Israelites, come on up here. We'll really show you something. Jonathan nudges Aaron Bear and says, you hear that? Aaron Bear says, I didn't hear anything. <laughs> Jonathan said, that's our sign. What follows is, I think, the most bizarre picture in all of Scripture. Here's, and the Scriptures is fairly specific. It's a steep incline, and they're having to climb up all fours. Jonathan's in front. And armor bearer is behind him, climbing up this steep incline on all fours with the armor bearer with one of the two swords in Israel. And these guys are yelling, charge! At the top are Philistine sentries and behind them an army with several hundred thousand men. And two little guys with one sword climbing up the side of the hill, yelling, charge. They get up to the top of the hill. The scriptures tell us 
that Jonathan starts knocking Philistine soldiers to the ground and Arvera comes along and he finishes them off with one of the two swords of Israel and pretty soon there's 20 dead Philistines Man. lying on the ground. Only 687,000 to go. <laughs> and all of a sudden, God takes over. Amen. And if you still have it open, it's in verse 15. Then panic struck the whole army. And those in the camp and the field and those in the outposts and the raiding parties and the ground shook. It was a panic sent by God. Now personally, I would prefer that God shook the ground before I attacked. But that's sort of the point of the story. You're with me, right? 20 dead Philistines on the ground. And then God took over. And I just believe Kansas is full of towns, townships, and counties, and cities where God wants to shake the ground under the enemy's strong. I just believe there's some ground shaking that he wants to do. I just believe he wants to shake the ground under the enemy's strongholds in some of our families. I just believe he wants to shake the ground in some of the strongholds that may even be in some of your churches that you pastor that are just holding back the grace of God. And I certainly believe that he wants to shake the ground under the devil's strongholds in the city, the town, the township that you serve and you minister in. I don't care if it's small. I don't care if it's big. God wants to shake the ground. I believe he's going to do some shaking. I love this. The enemy's heart just melts. It's, it says the Philistine soldiers were filled with panic. Can you imagine being in a camp? You're armed to the teeth. You, you, there's tents. There's soldiers as far as you can look all the way around. And two little guys are running after you with one sword shout attack. And you just melt down in fear. I mean, oh no, they're going to get us. You know, I mean, it's bizarre. It's like, wouldn't it be wonderful if God so moved that the enemy lost heart in your town? Wouldn't it be wonderful if the enemy's courage and his, his intention and his arrogance just melted? Wouldn't it be wonderful if God shook, shook the ground under the enemy's feet and he panicked and he wanted to be as far away from the living church of Jesus Christ that your pastor is in? I just believe you can do that. I told, you, I told you at the beginning, I believe he wants to send a spiritual awakening. So I come back to the question I really have not been able to get away from tonight for you. What is, so what's the risk you're going to have to take? You know, those risks always have dollar signs, unfortunately, with them. I was a poor college kid attending a little, very small aging church um, right by the University of Minnesota while I was still a student there. I remember one night a missionary spoke. I was dead broke. I was a poor student. I had $8 left. By the way, never take your last $8 to church. <laughs> I, I later heard somebody say, God won't ask for what you don't have, but he will ask for what you want to keep for yourself. I don't even remember what the poor missionary, uh, I should say poor missionary, he was an average speaker. It made no impression on me, to be honest. And I don't remember what he spoke about. But I do remember my pastor getting up at the end and saying, we're going to take an offering. And I heard this voice inside say, I want you to put your last $8 in the offering. I remember I had to buy two days the next week. I mean, this was, this was bare bones. And I said, I rebuked that thought. <laughs> and it came back. So rebuking it wasn't working, so I thought, I'll rationalize. So I said, God, I looked around 40 people in that service. I said, Lord, this offering, plus or minus $8, will not even be noticeable to that missionary. And then I went global on the Lord. I said, Lord, your global missionary enterprise will not rise in my eight or fall in my $8. And you know, you, you know how that voice is, don't you? Just was, it wouldn't go away. It's not the loudest voice we hear, but it's the most persistent. And it's deep. And he kept saying, I want you to give your last $8 to me. That missionary doesn't need it. My global enterprise doesn't need it. But your heart needs it. 
I need to know if you're going to live like a hypocrite as a believer, if you're going to live safe as a believer, or if you're going to trust me. And I remember I put my last eight dollars in the offering plate. I forget how God provided for me. All I know is He did, and He always has. And we, we never come to breakthroughs, even financially, in our churches and our ministries, unless we give it away. Amen. And we're going to need to make some investments in relationships with no guarantee of how they're going to turn out. This I'm passionate about planting churches because there are places where the church is not right now. And you know what? You know, I don't know. It may be a maybe. But what if you got near some people who don't have a church near them? Whether not near them geographically or not near them in terms of relationship. They may have a church just down the street, but they've never talked to a Christian in at least 10 years. But you dare to become their friend. And you dare to say, we're going to put a worshiping community near to the kind of relational context that you can relate to. Where we can begin to get to know one another. Wouldn't that be wild? Wouldn't that be wild? Yeah, but how do I know? You know what? This is all a maybe. But God's able by many or by few. You know, I just believe he wants us to be where people are and make not just dollar investments, but relational investments in people's lives. With no guarantee they'll get saved, but we've got to be there. Sam and I have, have two friends. Their names are Ken and Bell. They're a married couple. They live in Vancouver. Twelve years ago, I was pastoring great church in Vancouver, British Columbia, just before I went to Central Assembly. And Ken and Val said, Pastor, God started talking to us about taking the risk. We have a 20-minute drive to church every Sunday. And this was a large church, over a thousand people. And, and Ken was on my board. Val sat in the, in the music ministry. And, and they were they were probably about, at that time, about early 50s. They had no kids, but they were strikingly good looking. I mean, you could have called them Ken and Barbie and put them on the front page of any fashion magazine in America. I mean, they were very good looking, very sophisticated, and very godly. They've been in this church for years. But Ken and Val says, God told us while we commute to church that we should ask him who we should invite out for lunch. And we weren't supposed to put the parameters that you already know them. And sure enough, God led them one Sunday morning to a guy off the streets, a 24-year-old kid off the streets of Vancouver. I couldn't imagine somebody whose lifestyle was farther from Ken and Val's. Ken and Val took him out to lunch. I mean, this guy, and they paid Ken and Val. I mean, this guy, when does this ever happen to him? You know, he's a kid off the streets. And here's Ken and Barbie taking him out to lunch. No agenda except they want to get to know him. You know, at first I thought, that's not big a risk. Okay, let's pray who I take out to lunch. But that's a huge risk. Talking to people who may not even want to be with you. You know, daring to take some risk relationally. Daring to take your friendship circle and say, this year I'm going to expand it this much. Daring to go where there's not much church in certain cultural segments or certain geographic segments of this district. And say, I'm going to go and I'm going to take the risk of starting some relationships with some and then see what God does. It was funny, this guy came back the next week. After all, when was he last taken out to lunch? Of course he comes back to church the next week. And he brings some of his friends, finds Ken and Val after service, introduces himself, say, by the way, that was a great lunch last week. I'd like you to meet some of my friends. <laughs> so, four or five of them go out to lunch next week. They all come back the next week, bring more of their friends, find Ken and Val after the service. After two months, Ken comes to me and says, we took uh, 35 people out to lunch. He says, it's getting expensive because we still pay. He said, in fact, we sat around this great big huge table and added up all the jail time. And it was a very large number, Ken said. Couldn't imagine people more culturally distant than an established, classy, Pentecostal church people who thought, we're going to take a risk and if God asks us to take someone out to lunch, even though we may not know them, we will do it for the sake of investing in somebody. This Sunday they will meet with 150 people. And uh, they'll feed them too because God also saved the 
the chef of one of the fanciest hotels downtown. And he's going to fix him a beautiful meal. After, after they've had a service in a warehouse we renovated right next door. Sandy and I were there two and a half years ago, saw it with our own eyes. 150 people. Because somebody dared to say, Lord, lead us into a relational risk. And let's see what comes. And I just believe if we put the church where it's not, wherever people don't have the church, anywhere even in their proximity, relationally or geographically, if we're willing to take the risks financially, if we're willing to take the risks relationally, I believe God might do something. I just believe He might do something. I want you to stand just for a moment. I've been very attentive and I'm going to talk. We're going to have a specific way of responding in just a few moments, but I, I just like I just like you to present yourself before the Lord for a moment. Father, right now we thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity to be your church, to be alive in this nation to be a part of reaching this great state of Kansas. And for the sake of a hundred, uh, a million and a half unclean people, would you talk to us? Would you forgive um, all the ways in which we try to live too safely? Would you forgive us, oh God, for that? And Lord, would you put the spirit that Jonathan had in him, knowing that you're able by many or by few. Lord, we pray that we, like Jonathan, will either win or die trying. No other options. Father, we pray that you'll talk to us. We pray the power of your Holy Spirit will give us courage. And we want to say yes to what you're asking of us. Help us to know specifically the part we can play in the next thing you're calling us to as a network. And help us to not play it safely, but to play it dependent on you. I thank you for this wonderful fellowship. I thank you for their leadership that is here. I thank you for what you're doing throughout this, throughout churches, all through this network. Just bless them, encourage them in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. And I'd like you to watch this. came into the plains of water, now Kansas plains, had a burden for the plains Indians. He preached the gospel as he understood it to them. And at the end of two years, one of the tribes rose up and killed him for his preaching. I have been convinced for years that where the martyr's blood is spilled, God is going to do something special. God has big plans for Kansas. pretty obvious that people have been planting Assemblies of God churches in Kansas for about 100 years. We have 143 churches as of today. Why do we need more? We need church planters to come to Kansas. We need churches to plant churches because statistically speaking, over half the population of Kansas, almost 1.5 million people in Kansas are totally unclaimed. They don't know Jesus. They're not Christian. They're not Islamic. They're not Buddhist. They're totally unclaimed. There's several hurdles to uh, leaving comfortable places and planting a church in Kansas. People from out of state, when they hear Kansas, uh, it's not exotic. Kansas ain't sexy. Uh, Los Angeles, San Diego, San Francisco, Miami, Dallas, Fort Worth, Chicago, the, the big cities. But Kansas is a place of promise. There have been different groups and teams through the years that have strategized and put together uh, approaches to getting more churches planted in Kansas. And I'm really excited having people that are currently planting churches coming together, collaborating together, and sharing this journey. All of us trying to do the same thing, reach unclaimed people. It's sort of a little bit like when Paul and Barnabas on their second missionary journey, they decided to go visit the churches they had been to previously. They just decided they'd go do it. 
no bells and whistles, no vision from God, but they literally go and visit churches. And that's sort of how I started church planting. There's too many places that need churches. As we have learned, as we've been called to Kansas, the, the need is great there. There are people that aren't connected to a community of faith. Um, but we know that that means more than just attendance. We know that what that means is there are people that haven't experienced what we've experienced and perhaps what you've experienced. Church planting wasn't something that was really on, uh, on our uh, agenda, on our map. Uh, it didn't seem like there was a, a perfect time or a perfect season or how do we prepare for this. Uh, it, it really was just, just a, a response from, from God to just the compelling nature of the Holy Spirit to go out and do something that, that made a difference. We believe church planning is also God's heart. The, the scripture says that uh, do not despise new beginnings, for the Lord rejoices. He wants something new. He loves new beginnings. He says it in his words. You know, we have tons of stories of people's lives being forever changed. We have one story of Justin and Christy. They came to us on day one of our church plan gave their hearts to the Lord, and, and since then they've been baptized, um, both of them, and, and this next Sunday they're actually going to get married in our church service. Jesus said in Matthew 9 that the harvest was, was ready, it was plentiful, and I believe right now that Kansas is ripe for a spiritual harvest. There's too many places in Kansas, there's too many places in Topeka, there's counties in Kansas that do not have a Selzion church there's a great need. I'm believing God for 20 new Assumes of God churches to be planted between now and 2020. But how can we get that to happen? How can we see 20 new churches planted? It won't be just by people parachuting in and believing God and working alone and planting churches, although that's going to be a part of it. We need local churches to plant churches out of themselves. Ed Stetzer's a great author and consultant for Church Health. He offers at least four really good reasons for a local church to plant a church out of itself. First, church planting reaches lost people. Second, church planting actually follows the biblical pattern of the book of Acts. North America is lost. It is a vast mission field, and church planting is necessary to reach North America. And fourth, Stetzer says church planting benefits the local church, it helps us turn our faces outward instead of having our focus inward. I think Stetson gets it right on the money when he says, there's never a good time to plant a church. Do it anyway. So what steps can you take? Number one, I'm asking every church to consider giving 1% to the vision fund. And number two, I'm asking every church to pray about planting a church out of itself or partnering with another church so that together two or three churches can plant a church in an area that is desperately in need of the gospel. I envision a day that Kansas will be the easiest place in North America for people who are far from God, people who are unclaimed, to experience the life-changing presence of Jesus Christ. So we're excited for what God has for the state of Kansas. We knew that God um, blesses everybody that stays in the boat. We're, we're all safe, but when we step out of the boat, we experience Jesus in ways that other people may not. It's our responsibility to do something about the lost people in our state, in our communities, in our areas. Being able to plan allows us to mobilize the people beyond our four walls. I count as a
tried hard to honor what others had honored, even though the perception may have been there. I have tried hard to honor that idea that we want to pour in. But I come to you tonight saying, this is the time. We have a 2020 vision. 20 new Assemblies of God churches by the end of 2020. This is the time to ask for me to make a significant request of you, the men and women who lead the Assemblies of God in Kansas. This is the time to say, if we want to plant those churches, if we want to have finances to fund those, some of you are leading churches in, in your heart, logistically speaking, you're saying, well, with 17 people, it's like not likely that we're going to be able to, to send 17 people to start another church. The math doesn't work well with that. But you'd love to help others, and you can do that financially. However, I will say to you, in Romania, about 14 years ago, we met with a small congregation, a small Assemblies of God congregation in Romania, and there were 16 people that called that little local gathering place their church home. And they emphasized to us, 13 miles from here is a village without a Pentecostal witness. And eight of us next week will be meeting there to reach those who are not yet claimed. I'm asking this fellowship to help us with resource where we can say to church planters that work through the process and who, who are burdened, who are saying perhaps to be able to invest in them. I have cannibalized every church building that I can cannibalize that we've had to close because the work died. We've sold old parsonages. We've sold old buildings. I've got a building in Abilene that seems like I can't sell it for anything. The other day, Clemente Maldonado, the superintendent of the Latin American, Midwest Latin American district, called me. And he said, I've got a lady church planter that might be interested in that building. I've got a feeling I'm not going to be able to sell it to them either. with names, with heart, 
hearts with dreams, with aspirations, with addictions. And God is beginning to do something amazing in, in Kansas. And I'd like to invite you to be a part of it. We've tried so many things. So many remember CPR, church planting and revitalization funding. I'm asking you to stop giving to CPR and give to the Vision Fund. I'm asking you to stop giving to the camps and give to the Vision Fund. From the Vision Fund, we will fund church planting and revitalization and we will fund our camps. I'm asking that you take a risk and put resources Consider as local churches as a starting place, one percent of your monthly general tithes and offerings. Not designated monies. I'm asking, would you consider, would you take a risk? Would you take a leap with us? In just a moment, I'm going to ask you to fill these out. You say, Pastor Terry, I, I can't do one of these unless I've talked with my board. Okay. I'm not here to pressure you. I'm here to lead you in a direction that I believe is one of the steps we need to take as a fellowship in order to make a huge dent in that one and a half million number. Some of you are leading churches that are healthy enough to produce, reproduce other churches. I'm asking you, if you're going to launch a church out of your church, but it's going to be a year or two from now, give to the Vision Fund this year, and then don't give next year. Put that money into the launch. Look, I'm just looking for ways like you are to reach more people with this gospel. Individuals can use this card if you'd like. What would the Lord lay on your heart to do? Here's what we're going to do to respond. We've set up tables on the side, and we've got the entire front here. These baskets can contain some of the cards if you'd like, but you can just lay them on here or over there. And we're going to come together, and we're going to pray. We're going to spend these last few moments tonight before the evening gets away, and we're going to cry out to God one more time for there to be an earthquake that starts in Kansas, that rattles out to the borders that Chicago, that Chicago feels that Houston feels that Newport News feels that San Diego feels that Hawaii feels that the world feels because of the spiritual earthquake it started here take this card if you will perforated so you can tear it off and keep one piece and turn in the other, obviously the one with the name and city and church. As God enables, we've committed to give, there's three check marks available, percent of our general fund, a one-time gift of X and a monthly gift or a monthly gift of, it's to the AGK Vision Fund. These will not be unaccountable monies. We're not looking to create a slush fund. Unclaimed. Father, help us finish this job. You've never ignored the martyr's blood. not ignore the blood of the martyrs of just recent hours and days. And you will expand your kingdom where they give their lives instead of recanting their faith. Lord, you have not turned your eyes away from Kansas. It was populated by just a few thousand people, nomadic tribes of Native Americans that needed to know the true great spirit. 
Lord, you've been brooding over these rolling plains. Jesus, we're crying out that you let AGK be a leading edge movement. We can see more churches planted. Lord, maybe the 20 new churches by 2020, maybe my faith is way too small. But Lord, we've made declarations before. We've made goals before. But oh God, we're crying out, help us. Help us. Help us, Lord, in the cities where, where teeming thousands live and are unconnected to God, unclaimed for the kingdom. Towns and townships and villages and rural areas, counties that are in desperate need of Jesus, university campuses that are absolutely hedonistic and broken beyond repair by human hand. Oh God, give us Kansas. Help us to team together. Help us trust to work together and see more people reached in the next five years. If you tarry, you're coming, Lord. More people reached in the next five years than have been reached in the last 50 years. Perhaps we can see this happen. Help us now, Lord. Lord Jesus, I'm not asking for a good response because I need the validation. I'm asking, Lord, for a great response so that we might take more steps forward than we've ever taken. Lord, don't know what else to do. We're looking to you. May you give faith and grace as leaders in this room, as husbands, as wives, as lay people. Take a risk. Step, step out in faith and respond in Jesus' name. Please fill out your card and just as this team, they're going to lead us in, in a chorus to get us here, to just give us music to, to give by, to respond by. Will you stand, please? And as they begin to sing, I'm going to ask as soon as you've completed that card, I want you to come and place it here somewhere on this platform or on one of the tables on the side and scatter out all around the front, scatter out all around the front and go as deep as we need to go so that we can pray together, so that we can wait a little longer on the Lord, so that we can believe God together. Lead us in a song and as soon as those are filled, will you come and give those responses? Well, the Days of old, would you do 